Thank you, Richard. Um, I'll start with my slides. So I, um, Christian, I can't compete. <laughs> I'm amazed that you're so awake at 3.30 in the morning. Um, and uh, and I, I also feel just this immense gratitude to ICF and Richard for convening us all. There, there does feel like a wholeness in everything that we all bring together. Um, and it is something where the, the sum is greater than the parts. Um, and I look forward to seeing where that takes us. So thank you everybody for pulling us together. Um, I thought, you know, I think everyone here knows me from the Institute of Coaching, but I have another life. <laughs> and I wanna, I wanna just flash that up for a second because it kind of explains how I'm, I'm looking at this topic. Um, and Richard, I just want to say, I'm so glad that you didn't give me the uh, climate change topic. <laughs> 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 um, because this, the topic that you did assign to those of us at the Institute, this was new for me. So I had to go, you know, dig around and think about it a good deal. Um, and uh, I think climate change would have been a lot harder. So thank you for that. Um, so I, my, I grew up in the um, biotechnology industry. So for, for 17 years, um, I was uh, leading research and development teams. So I'm an MBA, but I, I, and a biologist. And so when I, when I got into coaching in 2000, my vision, I didn't intend to become a coach initially. My vision was to build a coaching profession in healthcare. So I viewed coaching as a way of realizing the potential of helping people take better, better care of their health and wellness. So I started a school, we built our a protocol, Richard, I didn't know you then, but it, it, it looks a lot like intentional change theory. It's a vision based, but it was it done independently based on self-determination theory, transcritical model, a whole bunch of models. And the school has now trained 13,000 coaches in 50 countries. We have a peer reviewed medical uh, textbook called the coaching psychology manual. So the, 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 the coaching techniques were science-based, and then now there are a dozen um, peer-reviewed studies with more than 100,000 coach, 100, coaching visits across a whole bunch of dimensions. So that was starting with building a protocol and getting to the evidence. And then we started the Institute, and then I gathered together the field 10 years later, and we partnered with the National Board of Medical Examiners. We now have a National Board Certification for Health and Wellness Coaching. Um, and a whole literature base. Um, I led the team that's built a compendium of all the literature. We have more than 110 randomized controlled studies. The American Medical Association has now approved uh, billing codes for coaching based on all of our work. I'm actually at the CPT panel in two weeks um, uh, advocating for these codes. And then I'm now leading the reimbursement effort for getting these codes uh, reimbursed and building jobs in healthcare. So, so I, I, I say all that because for me, for me, and that's what why I mentioned in our last session, for me, coaching is all about having a vision to change the world. And that's the mechanism for doing that. And David Peterson, I always remember you saying years ago um, that you pick coaching because um, it gets the job done that you want to get done. If there was something that worked better, you would do something else. And, and I really resonate with that. So then, so then moving to um, the topic of, of coaching folks who are in um, you know, in the, in the minority, non-dominant, the vision for me is that we're helping people reach their full potential and, um, and, and, and that the context matters, you know, Christian, you've explained beautifully how, when you bring coaching to a different culture, the, the culture has a huge impact on how you view coaching. So that's the bottom line. So there is a new um, documentary by Netflix that came out in August called Count Me In. And it's about drummers, rock drummers. And there are three, three I think, white and black women rock drummers. So think about that. What if we were coaching uh, women, black or white, who wanted to become rock drummers, just consider what they're up against. I mean, imagine them coming on stage at the Rolling Stones or, 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 you know, Pink Floyd or whoever, and there's a woman and, you know, you, you couldn't help but just think about how significant their challenges are to get there. And I, I, I start here because I just want us to like take in what this is about. You know, when you are stepping into a role that is completely outside cultural expectations, 
what you're really up against. And what you see in the documentary, uh, what I saw, and it was hard to see, that they were great drummers, but you could feel that they were still held back by their gender, that it wasn't, that it was, and, and that was my interpretation. So, so, you know, that's really what we're talking about is, is people who are truly held back by cultural, cultural considerations. Um, thanks to um, Angie, who sent me this article about women in the workplace that McKinsey put together uh, and uh, last year. And so what I just want to point to is that, so this is women, white men, men of color, white women, women of color, uh, uh, from entry level to C-suite and how, how, what the numbers have done in the last five years. So, so basically between 2015 and 2020, the number of um, women in C-suite and SVP FP levels have grown, you know, by a few percent, you know, uh, 22%, 18%, so significant. And then, uh, so in terms of considerations then, um, here's what McKinsey says now, due to challenges created by the COVID-19 crisis, as many as 2 million women are con considering taking a leave of absence or leaving the workforce altogether. So all this progress could well be erased. So we, so today, if we're not thinking about the impact of COVID, we're missing some of the social context. Um, Pierre Bourdieu has this beautiful um, framework and he describes this construct of capitals. So those are economic, education, social, cultural, things that are part of your family and upbringing. And then as you move into adulthood and organizations, you know, the, just the differential of access to capitals and non-dominant leaders truly have less access to capital. So they're way behind, like at 21 years old, you're already way behind in terms of access to the social networks, the financial, the education. And, and his, uh, the, the uh, authors who wrote an article about this relative to leadership development, said that you know we really do need to be customizing leadership development to those particular circumstances you know you can't just impose um, what you've got so you've got to think deeply about the impact of you know the entirety of their influences um, again back to angie um, I, I i don't think this article is published yet angie but there's in fact i think maybe the construct came from um McKinsey and others, but this idea of there's a broken rung. So when women become mothers, they the, the ladder breaks and um, they suffer their biases, um, expectations as mothers. Um, they are really thinking differently about their career preferences. And if you don't help them manage that transition into working motherhood, they can fall off the ladder. So that's a, another different context um, for coaching. Um, when just after George Floyd, Floyd uh, died, um, I set the intention to help out in uh, communities of color, and that's opened up a lot of different projects. But one of them is I'm working with uh, 25 um, police leaders, Asian and Black, at the Met Police in London. It's a long story how I came from Boston to London. And as I started that work, um, I dove into the you know all the issues around bias and race racism etc and I came across Praga Agarwal's book on unconscious bias which I highly recommend um, it is a tour de force of all the literature around this and um, whoops and this is I, I've presented this slide in many places so basically the brain crate, creates categories you know one of the biggest categories we create if, if not the biggest is our identities our identities want confirmation, so then we are, we hang out with our in groups, and then by virtue of having in groups, you have out groups, and then what happens to the out groups? A lot happens to the out groups. Um, painful things happen. Their categories judged, slighted, disrespected. They don't feel they belong. Their self esteem takes a hit. They are afraid of discrimination. They have huge amounts of stress and anxiety. They get sick. Black men um, have higher rates of heart disease, cancer. Um, as a result of the stress of being in the outgroup. The biases become self-fulfilling. Your competence and confidence are impaired. You have less access to resources and opportunities, and you don't reach your full potential. So if we're working with these populations, 
if we don't really understand what it's like to be in an outgroup, we're, we're missing a, a good deal of the context. This, this is an interesting paper I bumped into um, uh, called the, about the risk tax. Uh, so interviews with women and top women and minority leaders suggest they pay a risk task to, to achieve career mobility. So actively pursuing high risk assignments in order to stand out. So you, you take on much tougher assignments and it's precarious because you're, uh, you know, you get more scrutiny, you make a misstep, your career is derailed and there's a huge amount of um, strain on you. And so this risk task combined with having a high standard of perfection contributes to fatigue and increases leaders desire to exit their organizations. So you almost kill yourself, you know, per, uh, metaphorically um, in order to stand out. So that's a, an expensive price. Um, black women leaders and racial microaggressions. You know, this is a paper about um, all the things that black women deal with and then how they cope. Um, and those of us who are not experiencing those microaggressions and if we're coaching those folks, we really do need to understand what that, what that feels like. We need to bring that um, understanding into coaching. Then um, um, Christian, this is a paper you didn't mention. <laughs> this is so this is pandemic impact. And so there is a there is a literature now uh, around coaching during the pandemic. Um, and what do we need to know here is that the pandemic has uh, affected populations in very different ways. Some of us are thriving as a result of the pandemic where others are whole industries are going down the inequities um, in um, in COVID uh, impact. The burnout, um, I, I coach a lot in the healthcare space, the burnout of physicians and uh, healthcare providers is a, a catastrophic at this point. The mental health, you know, we all need to know a lot more about mental health than we ever used to. Um, there's long COVID, um, career disruption, and certainly coaching is showing impact in, in, in positive impact in helping people address the pandemic, improve their awareness, improve their resources, uh, renew their energy and increase their, their confidence. So um, these are uh, four books, all with many chapters and many scholars just on women in leadership. And I, as I was looking at all these books and beginning to scratch the surface, because I have to admit, even though I'm coaching women leaders, I have not read all these textbooks. And I don't, I'm not sure any of us, many of us as coaches who work with women leaders have read all the scholarly work. And so that really speaks to the fact that, you know, we have a lot more opportunity to help ourselves as coaches and others be far better informed about, you know, the much bigger fields than coaching and the much bigger literature that um, is tangential and next door to the work that we're doing. Um, and, uh, Eric's not here um, tonight, but uh, he and um, and um, is Sue Bonnie is it? What's her first name? Bonnie. Well, I'm sorry. I'm just. It's a bit late. I'm forgetting her first name. But anyway, they they uh, have a nice um, study. So back into my world, the pharma world, I, well, healthcare world. They did a study of 200 women managers in one big multinational in 20 countries, um, talking about. Um, uh, the, the gendered organization uh, and, and what very quickly some of the barriers were and this really comes across so I, having been in the biotech industry and lived in four countries uh, it's really tough for women to um, be senior in global countries because you got you got to move countries you got to take and, and a lot of people don't have the ability to change countries with family um, roles um, that sponsorship is very uh, inconsistent and women often don't have adequate networks. Um, and certainly coaching, both individual and group coaching was used in this study, improve efficacy and social uh, support. So, um, so there are very specific circumstances, again, for women in global organizations that wouldn't necessarily happen in other industries. This is just brand new out in HBR. Um, DoorDash has a program for women of color and they call it the Elevate program. Um, and it's in its fourth cohort and it's a mix of things. So this speaks to the fact that 
if we're going to actually tackle full, uh, helping people reach full potential with all these kind of disadvantages in their, their social context, it's going to take more than coaching. And, and so in this program, there's coaching, there's sponsors, there's workshops. These, the, these, uh, these women of color are attending leadership meetings that they wouldn't normally get access to. And the six month program is um, significantly increasing promotions, uh, improving their ability to navigate their careers. And, and also they're getting more recommendations for more career opportunities. So this is another example of a program. So then what are the implications of thinking more broadly about where coaching sits in this kind of universe of helping people self-determine? Um, I think it calls all of us coaches to get way more informed, uh, informed about the context. Um, you know, the family uh, implications, the bias implications. Um, I didn't really get into trauma, but you know, if you're working in black populations, you, you really do need to understand the legacy trauma from hundreds of years ago to the traumas of today. Um, the leadership issues in these different po po uh, populations in pandemic. And what struck me is that we, we could be doing more to collaborate across domains. So, you know, and, and uh, Andy, you men mentioned this as well. You know, we really, we really ought to be building bridges to the, to the scholars in other fields and, and partnering to, to study, um, uh, integrating their knowledge with our knowledge that it will take multi, I mean, back to the women who wanna be rock drummers, it's gonna take multiple modalities to support them. So coaching is really ideally embedded in a, in a package. Um, and that um, the identity of leaders, their efficacy, their, their work-life balance, self-care are uh, areas we need to consider. And then last, um, you know, as coaches, we talk about coaching the environment, coaching the culture. Um, I don't think coaching is going to get the job done if we're not also partnering with the folks that are focused on the organizational development and the, and the, uh, the external forces. Um, there's a nice review in, in um, Psychiatry Journal about resilience that I recently wrote an article about for the Institute. Um, and their conclusion was that what drives resilience um, is not uh, being rugged and tough and, and vigorous. It's more to do with external factors that support you, the, the external resources. And so I think just like um, if you're coming from a disadvantaged place, uh, doing things that influence the external environment are probably just as important as coaching. So, so with the, all that said, you know, I, I look forward to more conversations about how we can make a bigger difference but in collaboration with the other forces and the other scholars that are thinking deeply about impacting these groups.